It is foolish, if not dumb, to let a child whose brain is still developing to engage in violent sports. We can't really, you know, overlook the benefits of playing the sport. Um, if anything, for me, it has given me so much um, confidence, uh, fun, you know, um, and we can't keep that away from kids, you know, especially young girls. Welcome to Doha Debates. Each episode, we explore an urgent issue, present various sides on that issue, and try to see where, if at all, common ground can be found. We hope to bring you a conversation that's well-informed, spirited, but civil and respectful. I'm Karen Given, a broadcast journalist who spent a couple of decades working in sports. And today, we're looking into the ethics of contact sports and asking, when are games too violent to be played? We're going to evaluate big popular sports like American football, rugby, and mixed martial arts, as well as some emerging competitions. Before we introduce our guests, let's get a little broader overview of the topic. Since the time of ancient gladiators, violence has been a spectacle that has attracted large crowds. Even today, in boxing and mixed martial arts, a win sometimes hinges on knocking your opponent out cold or putting them in such physical pain that they bow out in submission. Even in sports where physically harming your opponent is not an explicit goal, some contact sports like rugby, ice hockey, and most notably American football have had a history of causing concussions and other head trauma. It wasn't until relatively recently that the extent of this trauma was widely known or studied. That is until our first guest got involved. Dr. Bennett Amalu has been a pioneer in understanding something called chronic traumatic encephalopathy, or CTE. His work, along with others, has led to new concussion protocols and has opened up the conversation about how to better protect athletes, both professional and amateur. But while advances in athletic equipment and new safety protocols have definitely made sports safer, they still haven't eliminated their fundamental violent nature. And it seems like the world's appetite for violence never abates, with new games like professional slap fighting or shin kicking emerging over the past few years. And yes, those are real sports. So now let me formally welcome our first guest, Dr. Bennett Amalu. He's currently the president and medical director of Bennett Amalu Pathology. He's also a clinical professor of medical pathology and laboratory medicine at the University of California, Davis. And he joins us from California. Welcome, Dr. Amalu. Hi, thank you for having me. Also with us is Babaloa Latsha. She's played rugby for South Africa's national team, the Springboks, and she's become the first African woman to professionally sign to a club in 2020. She currently plays for the Harlequins Rugby Club in UK, where she just came in from training. Welcome. Thank you for having me. And before we get into the discussion, I should also mention that we have two global listeners who will be joining us a little later in the conversation to offer their perspective and also pose questions to our panelists. Bennett, you've long been on the record as saying that some sports are just too damaging, especially for children. First, can you be specific? Do you think that some sports are simply too dangerous to be played by anyone? Or is it that some sports should not be played by children? Well, um, thank you for having me. Again, I've, I've always been of the position that no sport should be banned. Um, no matter how dangerous, skydiving, deep sea diving, auto car racing. Um, but such dangerous sports should be left for adults. All right. Children have not reached the um, age of. Um, volution of thinking or uh, age of consent to make such uh, dangerous decisions, okay? Now, we are talking about the high-impact, high-contact sports. The big six are American football, mixed martial arts, ice hockey, rugby, wrestling, and boxing, okay? Now, it will be interesting to know that in 1957, 11 years before I was born, the American Academy of Pediatrics, published a paper in the Pennsylvania Medical Society Journal that no child under the age of 12 should play American football, boxing, and wrestling. 
In 2011, the American Academy of Pediatrics and the Canadian Society of Pediatrics published another position paper that said parents and doctors should begin to discourage children from engaging in sports whereby the blows to the head are inherent to play. Okay? So knowing what we know today, for example, American football, in just one season, a child could be exposed to over 1,000 violent blows to the head. We know the human brain is uh, 60 to 80 percent water. The human brain has no reasonable capacity to regenerate itself. It's what we call a post mitotic organ. So every injury, no matter how small, even a concussion, that a concussion cannot be treated. Once you've suffered a concussion, you've suffered brain damage. So knowing what we know today, the human society evolves. And as we evolve, we become more intelligent. As we become more intelligent, we give up the less intelligent ways of our past. Mankind of 1880 was far less intelligent than mankind of 2023. About 50 years ago, a child could engage in child labor. 50 years ago, a child could smoke. 50 years ago, a child could drink alcohol. But we don't do those things now because we are smarter. So knowing what we know today, okay, based on the status of science, it is foolish, if not dumb, to let a child whose brain is still developing to engage in violent sports. We need, it's our duty as adults to protect the most vulnerable of society, the children. All right, let's bring in Babaloa. Some professional athletes make millions and millions of dollars for participating in their sports, but for the most part, these are adults making decisions about their own bodies. Should we be drawing the line and saying that some sports should be off limits to children? Well, I'm of the view that perhaps we shouldn't say that some sports be off limits to children, but we can make the sports child appropriate. Of course, you wouldn't expect a six, seven-year-old to be making real live tackles in real live rugby games. For instance, in rugby, we have what is called tag rugby. There is no collisions, no um, impact whatsoever. The child still gets to play with the rugby ball, but except you pull a tag off of him or her. Um, and the, the team that pulls off the most tags um, get to win. So I think that there are so many benefits um, within the sport, but... It has to be. It has to be appropriate for 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 young children. That, in my view, includes um, trained coaches who are able to to impart skills, which hopefully later in life the child would get to play fully professional sports. To be able to impart those skills and life set, life lessons and all the benefits that come with playing sport at a young age into those kids. So, I think we can we can, we can definitely make. Um, you know these sports, and I'm speaking specifically from a rugby point of view. That we can, we can, we are, in fact, making um, rugby, both men and women's rugby, um, more appropriate and fun and healthy um, for for children. And world rugby has many policies in place regarding tackle height um, for teenagers. Um, there are various age groups um, whereby a, a kid can start playing full contact rugby, and with whom they can play. So, I think we 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 can't really you know, overlook the benefits of playing the sport. Um, if anything, for me, it has given me so much um, confidence, uh, fun, you know, um, and we can't keep that away from kids, you know, especially young girls. But we can definitely, um, you know, make the sport much more appropriate for them. I'm curious, uh, at what time, at what point, at what age did you start playing tackle rugby? And are you worried about the stats that Bennett has told us about today? Yeah, I actually started playing rugby when I was 21. I'm 28, I'm 29 years old now. And um, admittedly, I have suffered one concussion, um, which which is something that we are to be wary of. You know, we, 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 we need to be aware of those things, um, which is why we have a really strict protocol um, on concussions and how to, well, in inverted commas, treat it and, and get back to, to, to playing again. So, um, you know, in as much as that I love the sport so much, it is worrisome, you know, that we have these stats. But again, um, you know, in rugby, we're not allowed to tackle anything above the breast. 
So head shots or neck tackles are, uh, you know, or, or, or a serious offense um, in my sport. So, I, I mean, th- there are ways to, to, well, to try to be careful about it. Uh, Bennett, I want to bring this back to you. Is doing things like playing flag rugby instead of tackle rugby at a young age, does that... Does that make you feel better? Or are you comfortable with that as a solution? Okay, now I need to congratulate Barbara. She started playing at the age of 20, 21. That is very smart. She started playing as an adult. But having said that, remember what I said. High impact, high contact sport. Okay? Not all sports. A sporting activity is meant to be regenerated is meant to be rejuvenating. A sporting activity is meant to build up your humanity, not to rob you of your humanity, not to damage your parts. Okay? So having said that, there are so many other less contact, less impact sports children can play, whereby blows to the head are not inherent to play. For example, I have a 13-year-old son. He plays basketball. Okay? My daughter plays volleyball. I have a cousin who plays table tennis. I have another cousin who does cycling. Now, in these games, blows to the head is not part of the play. Okay? Would incidental accidental injuries occur? Of course, accidental injuries occur in every human activity. But what you do is you you play very simply, diligently, with very strict rules to mitigate and reduce the risk of injury as much as you can, okay? The question I ask people, how can you make boxing safe? How can you make American football safe, flag or no flag? So instead of calling it flag rugby, why don't you create a completely different game for children to play? That is not rugby. Why must it be flag rugby? This is 2023. Okay, we are creating artificial intelligence. And you're telling me that we cannot create brain-friendly sports for children to play really? I reject you. We can do that. Babalo, I want to take this back to you because, as Bennett said, uh, what is the point of something like flag rugby? rugby? The second the coach's head is turned, those kids are going to want to play the way the adults are are playing. Why not just start with brand new sports, just sports that don't involve concussions and hits to the head at all? I foresee that to be a a little bit difficult because there is such a huge appetite for these sports within the general public. For example, in South Africa, we are a World Cup winning nation. Rugby is is our bread and butter. It's what we do. Rugby inspires young people, and it's loved by young people. You know, we have our first black um, captain who's won a World Cup. So when, if, we, if we then take that away from, from, from our society, and rugby is the one thing that unites us more than anything, especially in the case of, of South Africa. If we were to, re- to take that away, what do we replace it with? Um, you know, because rugby is what inspired kids too. I think the invention of new sports would be rather difficult rather than, you know, sort of safeguarding and taking better care of, of, of what we already have and the kids in those spaces. So I, I would actually like to pose the question to Dr. as in you know how 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 difficult would it be then to you know to 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 invent a new sport that is not rugby that is not boxing that would be as exciting and as beneficial to young people in general well um thank you so much for your question but the question you've just asked me is that uh, human beings cannot evolve that uh, we cannot do better than we did yesterday Okay, I think that is a, a, a negative way to think. I remember what I said. I did not say what well, we should be banned. I did not say any sport should be banned. But children should not play. Has anybody thought that if you don't let children play this game, 
and their brains developed to its full capacity. When they now start playing as adults with their brain capacity intact, they will take these games to levels that we had never seen before. Because when a child starts playing as a child, by the time he becomes an adult, his brain is already compromised. He's not performing at his best. And I use football, American football as an example. Do you know when you play American football in college, in one season alone, you receive about 1,400 violent impacts, some of which are 120 g force. As a society, are we sacrificing the lives of players just for our own transient emotional excitement? And these are the distorted expectations and norms of society we need to push back upon and change. All right, let's welcome some other voices who care deeply about sports and want to see sports being played responsibly. Nishina Privelon is from Haiti and is currently joining us from France. Nishina, what's your question for our guests? Also, thank you. Um, I would like to ask, I know that this debate um, this question is about um, what's about children um, um, be, um, playing these sports more safely, but I would like also for adults, you know, and uh, even though that's us stronger than kids, than children, how do we think, um, from, I mean, I'm talking as, by example, MMA, mixed martial sports, boxing, you know, that um is that uh, high contact sports, how can we really make that sport safer for adults? Because I know we can regenerate, but we are not, um, at some point, our body can can take anymore. So what can we do? The do we need to ban this sport in order to protect um, people, or can we have more um, safe foods to protect um, their body? Bennett, I'm going to let you take that one. So, all in the name of freedom and liberty, sports shouldn't be banned. Um, but people need to be educated to have informed consent before they play. For example, for the NFL and college football, I've, I've proposed a scenario whereby at the beginning of every season, there should be an hour or two lecture for the players, for the participants, where an independent expert comes in and lays it bare for them. Look, these are the risks you're, you're taking by engaging in this type of activity. Okay. Our attitude to sports is not rational. It's, it's, uh, it's driven by emotions, you know, uh, cognitive dissonance, all right? Uh, let, let's move away from that, especially when it comes to our children and be objective and protect children. For adults, hey, you want to engage in skydiving, good for you. You want to play Russian below, wonderful. Uh, that, that's your life. Well, I, I want to expand it a little bit because, Pablo, you do want to play rugby. Um, and so what is being done to make your sport safer? Right. It's a sport that you've chosen as an adult because you have the right to do so. Um, but do you look around your sport and and hope for improvement? Well, the, the, the biggest thing for for our sport regarding safety is really in the in the rules. So some of the responsibility lies within the players themselves um, the officials and the coaching staff to enforce those those rules those go um, into into training as well the type of equipment um, that we use and and so on um, you know there's been a really large um, amount of investment in terms of um, you know how how we we we, we enforce um, you know those rules in playing like I said, that there are certain parts of the body that you are no longer allowed to hit that in the past you could. So you could in in the past you could you could tackle someone at, at neck length and you know bang their head, but now you can't do that. That would that's that's a, a career ending, you know, sort of um sanction for, for 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 the person who does that. So I think that the the where we're moving towards now in rugby is is there's so much big focus on, on, on protecting, you know, the head and protecting the neck, especially in so much that we have, we now have a training regimen that includes strengthening our necks, you know, to, 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 to help with those, with those kinds of things. 
But I think I think in 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 few in in the near in the near future in the near future I think where to where rugby is headed, um, in terms of safety and how that is regulated on and off the pitch, you know, it's in my view it's getting it's getting better and better. Some would say that they prefer, which I'm sure Doctor would much disagree, or they much prefer the part the rugby from twenty years ago. So which means we can be innovative in in terms of how we look at our sport rugby in particular. Um, you know, and how we play it, I think. Nishina, I want to give you a chance to respond to that. What do you think of what our panelists have said? I remember um, that um, the uh, doctor said about the um, and the impact in American football that someone can have on, in one season. So I'm worried about the long term, about the life of these players after after these injuries and how long they can play this sport in their career. I think I can sum that up to a very simple yes or no question. Bennett, is there any number of concussions that's safe? <laughs> well, that, that has been established uh, many, many, many years ago. There is no threshold of risk exposure to um, blunt force trauma to the head. Uh, the human brain that floats almost freely inside the skull, 60 to 80 percent of water, wasn't designed or created to sustain any type of violent force. So what does that mean? You could suffer brain damage just following one hit. When you suffer a concussion, people need to know this. When you suffer a concussion, you've suffered brain damage. A concussion is brain damage. Okay. And it is a violent blow to the head whereby you have immediate manifestation of symptoms. But having said that, because the sports industry wants you to focus on concussions because they are not as frequent as the solve concussive blows. What does that mean? There is no self blow to the human head. The sub concussive blows are the violent blows you receive, but you don't have immediate manifestations of symptoms. But on the cellular level, on the microscopic and sub-microscopic levels, you have microscopic skeletal and membrane injuries to the brain cells. And over time, because the brain is post-mitotic, over time, all these minor blows you receive will accumulate to result in cumulative injury to your brain. And now listen to this. In 1969, the Royal Colleges of uh, Medicine of England determined by the study done by Dr. Roberts, that sometimes you, you may start manifesting symptoms up to 40 years after you stop playing. 40 years. Earlier this year, the Boston University came out with a, a, a study that showed that 96%, was it 96 or 92% of the brains of retired football players they examined had CTE, okay? But guess what my position is? Because CTE is not the only type of brain damage you suffer. There's a broad variety of brain damage. Okay. I think 100% have had evidence of microscopic injury to your brains. Those are 92% will have a CTE. All right. So no matter what sport you play, please first do not damage your brain. That is Orlando's position. Has always been my position. All right. I want to bring in another uh, voice who has been listening to this debate since the start. Nicholas Kamanzi is joining from Kigali, Rwanda. Nicholas, what is your question? Um, thanks. Um, I just liked uh, the last statement of Doctor that, you know, um, as much as you play, you also need to not harm someone. So my question is somehow aligned to that in a sense that, um, violent sports like uh, pass lab and, you know, rugby and all that, they all have uh, a certain degree of aggressiveness. And to some people, they tend to um, turn it into uh, a battle and not just a game. And what, what advice or what do you really think um, this uh, sports federation should be doing to avoid that. And my other question is, um, how do we teach um, kids, uh, children, youth um, uh, on, on not to imitate? Hmm. 
Yeah. Bubla, why don't you take that first? Yeah, I, I think <clears throat> what what can be done really is 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 a is is to educate. I think that's the first um really important thing about, you know, the tenets of the sport, the principles of the sport and the value of it. It's not to be malicious, but it's to enjoy, you know, a good game of rugby, for example. And so I think that there needs to be you no know, serious education around that, in, including federations and, you know, parents and all other interested people within within that within within that space. And the, the 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 truth is, sometimes you know we imitate sports people that we view to be our heroes, and um, you know we want to play like the be- like the best rugby player in the world. We want to, you know. But again, one needs to then, you know, differentiate between, you know, being malicious and enjoying the sport for what it 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 brings and 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 the values within it. And I'm wondering if there's also a need to educate the fans of the sport, because I don't know about in rugby in South Africa, but I know in the United States and Canada, there are fans of ice hockey who cheer for fights and try to get the players to fight, even though they know that that causes brain damage. Uh, Do you see that where you're from? I have to be honest. um, If anything, that is frowned upon in the rugby society because it, 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 rugby is, it, they call it a, a you know, a, a gentleman's game of, of, of some sort, you know, oddly enough, it's not, it, it really, it's a, it's more about camaraderie, you know, about friendship um about, you know, mutual respect, you know, those are the core values of rugby. If any, if anything, you know, fights are, are things that are quite frowned upon um, in, in our communities. So perhaps in other sports, but, as far in, in rugby, it, it really it really is frowned upon. Um, so I, I want to ask you this because I know Bennett, you are on the record by for saying that no sport should be banned. So let's not talk about bans, but let's just talk about ethically. Should a sport like slap fighting be allowed? Be should it exist? Let's not talk about banning it, but. Ethically, as humans, as good people on the planet, should we say yes? Let's have this sport. So there is a uh, this uh, uh, policy decisions that should be made by the professionals, the government. Okay. Uh huh. My position as a physician is is to care for humanity, and that is why I'm caring for the humanity of a child. If you're an adult. And you want to drink five bottles of beer every day. Lovely. Let human beings be human beings. So the slapping, the boxing, as an adult, you could do whatever you want to do. Let people exploit you and make money from you. Good for you. But when it comes to children, no. On the elderly, the two extras. No, I, don't, I wouldn't want an elderly person engaging the slapping. No, no, no. An elderly is above 65. So as an epidemiologist, my position, and it hasn't changed. No matter, many people don't like me because of what I have to say. But if you look at my positions over the decade, it hasn't changed. Okay? Children, no, 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 no. Elderly, no, 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 no. In between, from 21 to 65, oh my gosh. It's a free society. Babaloa, for you, is there any sport that's just too violent that we just, as humans, should say, no, we choose not to do this sport? Look, I, I have to be honest with you. I, I'm not a big fan of um, of the slapping competition. I'm not entirely sure what it's called. Um, it, 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 it just it just doesn't speak to 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 the tenets of of, of sports. You know, I I see I I see no. Um, real value in terms of um you know the camaraderie around it you know the spirit of it of enjoyment um you know of 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 fun allowing your body to move um you know and as doc said it be regenerative um and enjoyable i personally wouldn't enjoy a slap a slap competition at all um so how Again, it's it's entirely up to up to the person, but we also need to sort of differentiate between 
sports that we can make safer and the safe or safer and sports that we can't at all. I don't know if if if, if Doug has a different idea as to um you know how we can make sl- a slap competition safe for children in comparison to say for instance rugby where we can do away with the contact element completely and let kids play flag or tag rugby for example um you know all right uh nicholas i want to come back to you because your question has inspired quite a debate and i want to see uh where you fall in all of this well i think um the ball is um leaning towards an individual and their choices but i just think it doesn't entirely solve the problem that is here um perhaps maybe in the future there will be more rules um that will be um implemented but for now i just feel like um if we are moving the ball towards uh the choices and if let's say people choose to um go ahead and and, and play power slap then it's up to them and not me but um don't you think in a bigger picture you you have kids uh who are actually watching these things and they will try to imitate uh what they see and um grow uh, um in in the same uh energy uh try to basically um build their whole life around aggressiveness but i have a son to that may i sure of course you know, one life experience I had was when we were doing the movie Concussion. So they started talking about this classification, PG, this, PG, that, South is above my pay grade. But they made it PG-13 or whatever. And there were rules that there can be more than one um, sexual scene. There cannot be any cursing. Okay? Now, violent movies are made out, right? Is that what it's called? But they are for adults only. So in response to what the uh, participant has said, yes, we could come up with intelligent ways, violent sports, high impact, high contact sports, the big six I've just mentioned, okay, the big six, you make them R, meaning you're recommending to parents that children until they reach the age of 14 or, or 15 or 16 or 18, this is where the expert, pediatric experts need to come in, okay? Cannot watch such sports and shouldn't be in the field watching such sports. It's like taking a child to a gladiatorial fight, okay? It will traumatize that child. People are not aware of that. Like you said, it could traumatize that child and it could make that child have a cognitive distortion. A cognitive distortion that being violent is the way to go. Okay, so these are societal issues that we need to collectively and honestly begin to address. Babaloa, I want to run that by you because your your sport, rugby, is on Bennett's list of the major six sports that are dangerous. Do you think it's dangerous for kids to watch you play? Well, I I don't I don't think I don't think it is. I don't think it is dangerous. Um because of the, of course, the entertaining nature of it, but also it's, it's if you look at rugby, it it isn't all that violent and malicious like slapping or MMA. You know, there's so much to learn from a game um, of rugby. You know, when when you know um, a youngster watches it, but in the same breath, I think that parents and caregivers also have an important role to play, um, in in what in what they expose. What in what they expose or allow their children to be exposed um, to, much like watching a movie and a certain type of sport. But in the rugby setup, I, I don't I don't see a problem, you know, with 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 youngsters coming and enjoying um, a game of rugby and hope and hopefully getting to meet, um, you know, their 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 heroes and so on. You know, respectfully, Baba Wa said uh, the malicious net, you know, rugby is a gentleman's game. I disagree. And why do I disagree? It is malicious in that you're causing a human brain to undergo a sudden disolation that will cause sudden injury of the brain. There's no doctor who will deny that. 
So, you know, like I have said, let us tell ourselves the truth. The truth may be inconvenient, but please let us not deny the truth because of its inconvenience. So I think this is a great time to pause for a second and see if we have any common ground. So Bennett, I'm going to challenge you first. What has Bob Loa said that you agree with today? No, she didn't play the shit on 21. I mean, yeah, my, uh, <laughs> she's, she's, she's confirming what I have said. You know, uh, uh, why did she stop playing at the younger age? So she confirms my position. All right. Uh -huh. After that thing she has said, I, I don't accept. I'm not saying she's wrong because that's her opinion. I respect her opinion. I respect her opinion. And I'll be the first to fight and die for her to have her own opinion. Oh, okay. Uh -huh. But I, I don't accept those. Um, you know, we shouldn't place the excitement of sports over the humanity of sports. Life is too precious for them. What makes you a human being that makes you different from a goat or sheep or dog is your intellect. It's the most precious commodity, the, the, the highest equity you have outside time in your life, your brain. All right, Babaloa, same question for you. What has been it said that you agree with today? Well, well, of course, the 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 the, the danger of, of high impact sports is is quite evident. You know, we we, we know that. But um, my stance, with all due respect, is that we can make these sports safer for younger people. Um, we can't. Well, I wouldn't want to to take that opportunity away from them to participate in them, but definitely to make it or tailor make it um, to be suitable for for younger individuals. If I may add something, you know, I really respect you, Baba Law, Baba Wa, okay? I do. Because look at what you've said. Let's make this sport safer. You did not say, let's make them safe. Can you make fire safe? No. But if you make fire safe and put it in a lighter, it is still fire to burn it. So it applies to high impact, high contact sports. But the good thing is that there's no alternative to fire. But the alternative is to high impact, high contacts. Babalua, I want to just give you the chance to have the final word if you want it. <laughs> well, gosh, in, in conclusion, I must say that it, it's been a really interesting, um, you know, conversation to have. I think it has actually, you know, opened up, um, you know, you know, my mind to, to different ideas, um, you know, or ways of thinking about sports in general. Um, but with that being said, I very much do enjoy um, playing rugby. Um, I've been playing it for many years and it has given me a life. Um, so I really think it's about it's about enjoyment. You know, it's about seeing the world. It's about, you know, changing, you know, narratives and lives of, of young people in a responsible manner. So, um, yeah, I very much enjoy rugby and I hope to enjoy it for many more seasons to come. <laughs> <laughs> all right. I think we're going to have to leave it there. My thanks to all of our guests today, Dr. Bennett Amalu, joining us from California, Baba Loa Lacha, joining us from London, and our global listeners, Nishina Prevelon, joining us from France, and Nicholas Carmanzi, joining from Rwanda. We should mention that Nicholas is a Doha Debates ambassador. To find out more about that program, visit DohaDebates.com. Thanks for listening to Doha Debates. I'm your host, Karen Given. Doha Debates is a production of Qatar Foundation. Our podcast is produced by FP Studios and Doha Debates. Our producers include Daniel Dazi, Rosie Julian, Claudia Tady, and Katrine Dermody. Special thanks to James Woolley. FP Studios Managing Director is Rob Sachs. Our executive producers are Jafet Weeks, Amjad Atala, and Jigger Mehta. To learn more about Doha Debates, please head to DohaDebates.com, where you can find out more about our podcasts, short films, upcoming events, and more. And please, if you like our podcast, follow and share your reviews. Thanks for listening. <laughs>